This is why the evil God hypothesis is irrelevant in a biblical worldview. Despite that, after days of research, it would seem that Christians on YouTube are struggling with their answers to this challenge. The kind of responses we typically give allow the atheists to reverse our argument and use it against us. More on that later. For now, I've separated this video into four digestible sections. The argument is based on the premise that God is infinitely good. But there's a famous problem with this view called the problem of evil. If an all-powerful God exists who is capable of eliminating all the evil in the world, then why doesn't he? If God is good, then why doesn't he simply eliminate all of the evil in the world? Well, he's going to, and he's promised to do so in his own perfect timing. If the question is, why is evil allowed to exist in the first place, we'll get to that answer later. First, listen to how he describes the problem of evil. Why does evil exist? Why do people get cancer and murder each other and put pineapple on pizza? The atheist philosopher J. L. Mackey famously concluded that since if a good god existed, he would want to remove all evil and would have the power to do so, the existence of evil in the world therefore shows that a good god doesn't exist. We're going to approach this argument momentarily, but first I want you to consider that cosmic skeptic should not feel like he has a right to bring up the problem of evil. I'll allow him to explain why. But before I can have such discussions, I need to solidify my moral philosophy and explain it as precisely as I can to you. And so I've decided to make some videos doing exactly that. That means that there are a few things I need to cover. First, I need to explain what I mean by morality. Not just what is good and what is bad, but what is good and what is bad. Then I need to show why I think that morality is and has to be subjective. And this means I need to first show why religious morality is subjective, even if God does exist, and even if he really is the author of good and bad. And then I need to show why atheistic notions of objective morality, like Sam Harris's for instance, are also flawed and ultimately subjective too. The reason for covering both bases is to attempt to show that not only is morality subjective, but it has to be subjective, regardless of the existence or non-existence of God. We have to take this information back with us to the original issue. And that's the idea that the existence of evil is a logical problem for God's existence. And you can only use this argument if evil is objectively defined in your worldview. In this kind of worldview, evil is defined individually according to preference. It was intended as a joke, but saying that evil is a problem for God's existence would be equivalent to saying that people putting pineapple on pizza is a logical problem for God's existence just because you don't like it. In a consistent worldview, Cosmic would not be allowed to present evil as a problem. Okay, you probably already know this, but here's something for your attention. Religious believers have many, many ways in which they respond to the problem of evil and defend the idea that a good God exists despite the existence of evil. Call this the good God hypothesis. Religious defenses of the existence of a good God in response to the problem of evil are sometimes called theodicies and include arguments like Evil is necessary to obtain higher order goods, or evil exists due to human free will, things like this. But today, I want to show you why most theodicies that the religious put forward to defend the good God hypothesis can actually be reversed and used with equal plausibility to prove that if God exists, he is in fact maximally evil. And we can call this the evil God hypothesis. Now, hold on though, this is ridiculous. We've already determined that you cannot present subjective evil as an objective problem. It's only a problem for you because you would prefer that something doesn't exist. As soon as someone enjoys pineapple pizza or theft, the problem of subjective evil goes out the window. However, not all atheists are able to admit that they cannot justify objective morality. They still try to cling to it and will present the problem of evil with confidence. So how do you justify the existence of evil? Listen to how these Christians attempt to explain it. At the end of 12 years of religious education, I was an atheist. And then I came to Columbia. The sticking point in all that uh, regarding religion for me was the Holocaust. I looked at that and I said, how is it possible 
that six million people could be exterminated in the course of a war that took 80 million lives and there could be a God. How do you answer that question? There's, uh, I, actually I'm going to push back and ask you, there, there sounds like there's two motives behind the question. Maybe they're both true for you. They're, they're both very important questions. One is, is how could European civilization, which is based on Christianity for a thousand years, produce something like that? Or was it much more general, and that is how in the world could God allow that kind of evil and suffering? That's the question I want. The wanted. second one. Yeah, the second yeah. one. Much more interesting. The Christian view of God is very different than the other views of God because the Christian view of God is that God came down, came into this world and suffered. Now I have a cat and my wife and I love our cat and we, we, we actually saw it once, we broke its leg by accident, <laughs> but we fixed it <laughs> for only a thousand dollars. Which we never in a million years would have thought we would ever do for a, for a cat. But well, you broke it. So. We broke the cat. <laughs> You're kind of morally obligated. And I, it book. suffered. It suffered. However, I think it's fair to say, because it doesn't have the same kind of self-consciousness, I, I would say that a human being suffering is probably at least sort of a, some kind of higher order. You're more aware of things. You're, you know, it's, it's, there's more agony than a... Than a if God really came to earth in Jesus Christ, then, and the suffering he went through on the cross voluntarily would have been far beyond my suffering. Now, what does that do? It is not, we, even after you believe that God would have come down and become vulnerable to suffering and death, that does not yet give us an answer to the question of what the reason is that God allows evil and suffering. But it does tell us what the reason isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us or he wouldn't have come down and gotten involved. It can't be that he doesn't care or he wouldn't be involved. I don't know what the reason is he hasn't stopped it yet, but it can't be a lack of, it can't be a remoteness, it can't be indifference or he wouldn't have come and gotten down and involved. Now that assumes you believe the gospel, but if you believe the gospel, what it does is it keeps off the idea of indifference and says, I don't know why he hasn't stopped evil and suffering. I think that the emotions that suffering brings about are important. But again, this idea, and, and I love the way that John Lennox phrased this question, but what is Jesus What is Jesus doing up on that cross? If it's true that Jesus is God, what is he doing up on a cross? Why is he being tortured? Why is he suffering? Doesn't that point to the fact that God has gone into the business of solving the problem of evil, that he has gone into the business of dealing and contending with human evil. You, viewer of this video, might not fully understand his approach, but that's different than, than that he hasn't taken any approach at all. So moral evil really is evidence for God. If, if there was no God, there wouldn't be any moral evil. But here's the question that I have to struggle with. Is there purpose behind God allowing this moral evil to happen? Is there a reason why God, and I'm going to give you <clears throat> four reasons why I think God legitimately allows moral evil to happen in this world. And the first, probably biggest reason is the, the phrase free will. Free will. Free will is a good thing. Free will is my ability to choose what I'm going to do next. You know, I can choose to keep talking and deliver this message, or I can choose to grab my wallet and go to Krispy Kreme and get a donut but I will choose wisely. <laughs> no, I will, I will choose to, to keep going here, but it's a decision. I don't have to even be here. You didn't even have to show up today. Oh, but my mom made me. Well, you actually, you could have stabbed her with a fork and then ran the other way. I mean, you have free will. This is free will that you have. <clears throat> now, free will is a good thing. Free will is a good thing. I think we agree with this. I like being able to choose things in my life, but there's a problem with free will and free will is this. It allows evil. You can't really allow true free will without also letting people do wrong things. A world containing creatures who are significantly free and freely perform more good than evil actions is more valuable, all else being equal, than a world containing no free creatures at all. Now God can create free creatures, but he can't cause or determine them to do only what is right. For if he does so, then they aren't significantly free after all. They do not do what is right freely. To create creatures capable of moral good, therefore, he must create creatures 
capable of moral evil, and he can't give these creatures the freedom to perform evil, and at the same time, prevent them from doing so. As it turned out, sadly enough, some of the free creatures God created went wrong in the exercise of their freedom, and this is the source of moral evil. The fact that free creatures sometimes go wrong, however, counts neither against God's omnipotence nor against his goodness, for he could have forestalled the occurrence of moral evil only by removing the possibility of moral good. Paul Draper notes, In order for a logical argument from evil to succeed, it is necessary to show that, for some known fact about evil, it is logically impossible for God to have a good moral reason to permit that fact to obtain. This, however, is precisely what most philosophers nowadays believe cannot be shown. And so the free will defense succeeds in showing it is at least logically possible for God to exist alongside evil. As you can see, the four examples we looked at only offered one solution to the problem of evil, and that's the idea that humans having free will is important to God when structuring the universe. But where do they get that idea from? Does the Bible even say that? The defense we hear is that humans would not be capable of moral good if they were not capable of moral evil. But where do they get the idea that man is capable of moral good? The Bible says that the thoughts and intentions of the heart are only continuously wicked, that all of our deeds are like filthy rags, that no man does good, no, not even one. That means that every single action that man takes is evil. These guys didn't get this concept of the will of man from the Bible at all. And since these arguments do not come from God, the atheist can easily reverse them against us like he's about to do now. Okay, so to understand this challenge properly, because it might well not be clear yet, we need to return to the good God hypothesis and the problem of evil. How do, say, Christians defend the good God hypothesis against the existence of evil? Well, let's have a look at three of the most popular examples of theodicies that are widely used by the religious, and you've probably yourself heard them before. First, evil exists because God gave humans free will. For human beings to be truly good and be able to love God, they need to do so freely. Right? If we were all robots determined by God to always do what was good, we'd be compelled into loving him and doing good deeds, which isn't true love or true goodness at all. Right, loving someone because you're forced to isn't really love, it has to be given freely. So God thinks a world in which there is free will is far more valuable than one without it, and he gives humans freedom to do as they please. Unfortunately, to be truly free, we need to have the freedom to choose evil. And many humans do, and that's why evil exists. It's the price we have to pay to be able to be genuinely, freely good as well. We can call this the free will theodicy. Here's a second one. Evil exists because it is necessary for higher order goods to obtain. For example, take the good of bravery. Bravery can only exist in the face of danger. Right? If there's no such thing as fear and danger, there can be no such thing as bravery. Similarly, without the existence of uncertainty and trepidation, there can be no such thing as hope. So God allows these lower order evils because they're needed to produce desirable higher order goods like bravery and hope, which only exist as responses to evil. We can call this the higher order goods theodicy. Finally, here's a third theodicy. Evil exists because without it, we couldn't have a conception of good. If everything was good all the time, we wouldn't notice it and so couldn't appreciate it. As C.S. Lewis timelessly put it in a slightly different context, a man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Unless we know what evil is, we can't know what good is, since we have no reference to compare it to, and so we can never even recognize its presence. We can never truly appreciate it. So call this one the appreciation theodicy. Okay, so there we have arguably the three most popular ways in which the religious defend the existence of a good god against the problem of evil. And most religious people watching this will probably subscribe to at least one of them. But what has this got to do with the evil God challenge? The three potential theodicies he presents are free will, the higher order of goods, and appreciation theory. And again, because these philosophies come from some random person's mind and not scripture, 
Watch how easily he can reverse them. But now, hold on. I just offered three theodicies that the religious like to use to defend the existence of a good God. But what if we can use the same theodicies to defend the existence of an evil God, despite the existence of all this good in the world? Well, as it turns out, we can. And let me demonstrate this to you now by defending the evil God hypothesis against the existence of good using exactly the same theodicies that I used a moment ago to defend the opposite. So, if God is maximally evil, why does so much good exist in the world? Theodicy number one, the free will theodicy. Good exists because God gave humans free will. For human beings to be truly evil and to be able to harm each other maliciously, they need to do so freely. If we were all robots determined by God to always do what was bad, we'd be compelled into doing bad deeds, which doesn't truly make us bad at all, since we wouldn't be responsible for the actions. As Stephen Law writes, an evil god could have created a universe populated with puppet beings that he ensured always behaved unpleasantly, but the behaviour of such puppet beings lacks the dimension of moral responsibility that transforms such acts into actions of the most depraved and despicable kind. To maximise evil, an evil god would want us to perform cruel and selfish acts of our own volition. So that's why a maximally evil god would give people the freedom to be good, because it's the price he has to pay to be able to create people who are also capable of being genuinely, freely evil. And since everyone is okay with just making up their answer from the top of their head, his free will theodicy is just as good as ours. Theodicy number two, the higher order evils theodicy. Good exists because it is necessary for higher order evils to obtain. For example, take the evil of betrayal. Betrayal can only exist in the face of trust and friendship. If there's no such thing as trust and friendship, there can be no betrayal. Similarly, without the existence of love, there can be no such thing as heartbreak. Without the good of having something pleasant, there can be no such evil as loss or grief. So God allows these lower order goods, like trust and pleasantness, because they're needed to produce desirable higher order evils like betrayal and heartbreak and loss and grief. So God allowing these goods to exist is actually a way to maximize evil overall. If we can just arbitrarily determine God's wants and desires from creation based on what feels logical to us, then so can he. Theodicy number three, the appreciation theodicy. This is the most interesting to me. Good exists because without it, we wouldn't have a conception of evil. If everything around us was evil and depraved all the time, we wouldn't truly appreciate it because we'd have no context or reference for comparison. By providing a world containing lots of beauty and virtue, evil God provides a contrast against which we can fully appreciate how bad the existence of evil is. As Stephen Law puts it, if everything were uniformly, maximally ugly, we wouldn't be tormented by the ugliness half as much as if it was peppered with some beauty. Not only this, but consider the fact I mentioned earlier that some people have wonderful, luxurious lives, and this seems to suggest that God isn't maximally evil. But by allowing some people to live in luxury, it makes it all the more painful and depressing to live in poverty and sadness. The fact that a homeless man is living on the street and freezing to death in the winter is surely evil. But if that man is freezing to death right outside a mansion in which other people are living comfortably and warmly in luxury, doesn't this make it more evil that the homeless man is freezing to death? Isn't it more bad to think that someone is suffering when there are others who are not and who have the capacity to help him, but refuse? By allowing some people to live luxurious lives, evil God makes the suffering of others all the more acute and impossible to bear. And the randomness of either being born into wealth and health or poverty and sickness makes being born into the latter all the more evil since it's so arbitrary. So to maximize the suffering of those people, an evil god would allow some people to live luxuriously to provide a painful point of comparison. We've seen how easy it is to refute a theodicy that comes from our imagination. So what does the Bible say about this? To illustrate, let's look at the story of Joseph. It came to pass that when Joseph, grandson of Abraham, had come to his brothers, 
that they stripped him of his tunic and took him and cast him into a pit, intending to leave him for dead. They changed their mind, however, and decided to sell him as a slave to a caravan headed for Egypt. After years and many trials, Joseph ends up as second in command of Egypt and in a position to condemn his brothers for their actions against him. Instead, Joseph forgives them, explaining that while they intended their actions for evil, God intended their actions for good. We see the same thing take place in the Gospel. In Acts chapter 4, we see all of the evil which was done to Christ was determined beforehand to be done to him. We know that God's intention with this evil was to pay for the sins of his people. And we also know the intentions of the people who perpetrated it. Judas was greedy. The Jews thought he had committed blasphemy and rejected him. But this only proves that God uses the evil of men to accomplish his good purposes. It still doesn't answer why evil is used in the first place. To answer that, we'll need to look at Romans chapter 9. If you've read the Bible at all, then you should be aware that it speaks of the wrath of God, which is revealed against all unrighteousness of men. Romans chapter 1. This adds the concept of divine wrath to his list of infinite attributes. Romans chapter 9 explains that God desires to display his divine wrath in judgment, right next to his mercy in grace. So, evil does not exist so that we can appreciate good. Evil exists so that we can appreciate grace and mercy. We are the evil. It comes from inside of our hearts. If we are not all evil, then we cannot appreciate how gracious it is for God to have mercy on us. This theodicy cannot be reversed because I didn't come up with it. God has spoken. You cannot say that an evil God desires to display how much he hates goodness so that he can display mercy, because there is no mercy to be found in a maximally evil God.